Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to be sharing an amazing archaeological discovery with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episode starts, all sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. Welcome to the first episode of Season 12. This week, I'm covering a famous burial that has captivated imaginations for decades. The tomb of Emperor Qin Shui Hong, the first emperor of China, holds thousands of terracotta warriors. They stand at the ready, waiting for battle. This discovery has opened our eyes to the many wonders of ancient China. I have a few quick notes before we get started. Firstly, I apologize if I pronounce anything wrong in this episode. I did research with pronunciation guides, but I am nowhere near fluent in Chinese. Secondly, I want to thank today's sponsor. Madeline supported this episode on the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Thank you. Now, without further ado, let's start the episode. In 1974, a group of farmers were digging on their land in Lingtuang County, China. They were working to create a new well, and the area was known to have a number of underground springs to tap into. This group, which consisted of Yang Shi, his five brothers, and his neighbor Wang Choi, were working about a mile, or 1.5 kilometers, away from a large mound known as Mount Li. Suddenly, the farmers uncovered a few terracotta heads and other fragments. Although for centuries, ancient artifacts had been found in the area, the group had no idea that they had just uncovered one of the greatest finds in history. They reported the find, and soon archaeologist Zhao Kangming was sent to the area. He knew that the mausoleum of the first emperor was in the area and immediately recognized the importance of the fragments and set out to find more. Over the next decades, archaeologists excavated the necropolis. Using ground-penetrating radar, they discovered that the site covered an impressive 38 square miles or 98 square kilometers. The famous tomb is only part of the complex. It was actually designed to mimic the emperor's palace complex as it would have been in real life. This way, he would have the same luxuries as in the afterlife. One of the most important discoveries of the necropolis are what archaeologists have dubbed the army pits. Although records of the first emperor tomb survived, none of them mentioned the army pits and there hasn't been another example found from ancient China. There are four army pits. The first one is the largest and is divided into 11 rows. Each row contains soldiers, chariots, and horses in battle formation. There are around 1,900 figures in there. There's also evidence of lampposts, which shows how the workers were able to craft and arrange everything while working deep underground. Pit 2 contains multiple ranks of soldiers, included infantrymen, archers, and the cavalry. They are split up into four sections, and there are several hundred figures in this pit. The third and fourth pit seem almost unfinished. Pit 3 has only a few dozen figures and are arranged in an unusual way, as if they were waiting for a figure that never made it in. The fourth and final pit was created, but no terracotta warriors were discovered inside. Some archaeologists theorize that the emperor died before the pit could be finished. Even without these full pits, there are more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. It's important to note that this is just an estimate because the site hasn't been fully excavated. In fact, it's unlikely that that will ever happen. This is because the soil contains toxic levels of mercury. Sima Qin, a historian at the court of the first emperor, wrote that his tomb was surrounded by 100 rivers of mercury. This, at the time, was believed to keep people from aging. So it's likely that there are rivers of mercury underground that have been leaching into the soil for centuries. As I mentioned in the introduction, this tomb belongs to China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, who was born as Yang Sheng, the son of the king of the Qin state. When he was 12, his father died, and Ying Sheng became the king of Qin. For the next 26 years, he worked tirelessly to conquer the other kingdoms of China. Finally, at age 38, he declared himself Emperor Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. During his reign, multiple regional walls were united into what we now recognize as the Great Wall of China. He also worked to create a national road system. However, the emperor is also known to have burned books and executed scholars. His complicated legacy was recorded by the historian I discussed earlier, Sima Qin. This isn't the knowledge of how the tomb was retained throughout the centuries. Emperor Qin Shi Huang died in 210 BCE at the age of 49. Luckily for his servants, army, and advisors, the emperor chose crafted versions of them for his tomb to serve him in the afterlife. It wasn't unheard of in ancient times to have people executed and then buried with the ruler to serve the same purpose. His reign changed the trajectory of Chinese history and archaeology forever. 
Next, we are going to examine the warriors more in depth. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part, it's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Hi there, my name is Annalisa and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support Accessible Art History monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's take a look at how the warriors were created and designed. As I mentioned earlier, there are thousands upon thousands of figures from different ranks of the military. But what is absolutely incredible is the fact that each warrior is life-size and unique. Sculptures created heads with varying hairstyles, facial hairstyles, and facial expressions. Their armor was also different based on their rank and job in the army. The amount of time that this would have taken is mind-boggling. In addition, as with many ancient sculptures, these warriors would have been painted with bright, vivid pigments. Most of it has flaked away over the centuries, but there are some spots that are still visible. Most of these pigments would have come from plant or dirt-based minerals, but they still would have given an incredible lifelike air. Due to their martial classification, some of the warriors have weapons, including swords, bows, and arrows. In the case of the swords, they were remarkably preserved. They have shown scientists that Chinese metallurgy was far more advanced than originally thought. In fact, one way they treated the swords wasn't rediscovered until 1937. Unsurprisingly, the terracotta warriors have captured the world's imagination. The thought of an entire army buried for centuries is just too interesting to resist. In addition, excavations have unlocked knowledge about ancient China and its formations that have furthered scholarship. Today, curious travelers can visit a museum dedicated to the terracotta army and the archaeological site. However, and thankfully, the Chinese government recognized that not everyone can make it all the way over there to see the warriors in all their glory. So, they have frequently allowed pieces of the army to travel around the world. In fact, I was lucky enough to see them in 2017 when they came to Seattle. I have some pictures on the blog if you want to check it out. I find it amazing that even after 2,000 years, we are still learning from the Terracotta Warriors. The Terracotta Warriors are just one example of how powerful rulers of the past were. The first emperor of China spent his entire life working to unite a country under his power, and he planned his afterlife to ensure that he would never be forgotten. In fact, we get the name China from the first kingdom he ruled over, Qin. I would say he succeeded in his goals. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the Rosetta Stone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history and keep an eye out for the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, episodes will start being uploaded in a few weeks, so subscribe there too.